Welcome to the Independent Advisors Podcast, where we dive into the world of stocks, tradable markets, and financial planning with Jessup Wealth Management's Chief Investment Officer, Mark McEvely, and CEO, Matt Jessup. You'll hear tips, tricks, and strategies to address your financial well-being, and most importantly, conveyed in a way that everyone can understand. Here are your hosts, Mark and Matt. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 176 of the Independent Advisors Podcast, where Matt Jessup and I, Mark McEvely, bring you everything you need to know from the past week in the world of financial markets and financial planning. This week, we're going to be deviating from our normal schedule to welcome AJ Conway uh, as a guest on the podcast. So AJ, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So, uh, so AJ is the head of European fixed income trading at WH Trading LLC. Uh, AJ and I actually graduated from the University of Dayton together, uh, and I think that his insight and expertise in, in futures trading, options trading, and, and market making would be extremely interesting to, to our listeners. Um, but before we get started, AJ, I just want to run through performance numbers of the major indexes that we track for listeners. So uh, go ahead and grab a, a cup of coffee or a pint. I don't know what, what time is it where you are right now. It's it, it's about the pint time. It's getting there. Not quite. <laughs> all right. All right. Two o'clock. So uh, these numbers are as of the market close on November 16th, and this data is from YCharts. Uh, S&P 500 index up 2.2% for the month and down 17% for the year. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 2.5% for the month, down 7.7% for the year. NASDAQ Composite Index up 1.8% for the month and down 28.5% for the year. The iShares Russell 2000 Index up a half a percent for the month, down a little more than 17% for the year. Vanguard International uh, All World X uh, US ETF up 9.5% for the month, down 18% for the year. Three month Treasury rate sitting at 4.32% two-year treasury at 4.35% and the 10-year sitting at 3.67%. So before we started recording here, AJ, we were talking about how with everything that happened last week from the midterm elections to the blow up of FTX uh, to the inflation numbers and the stock market rally, uh, we said that we probably could do a full podcast just based on what happened last week is obviously it's making you know, a lot of headlines and I'm sure we'll work some of that stuff into, into the the podcast here. But I guess just to start off, can you just tell people, you know, what you do, you know, who you work for, uh, how you got to where you were or where you are? So um, I work at WH trading. It's a proprietary trading company based in Chicago. I'm in London, but it's based in Chicago. Uh, A proprietary trading company. All that really means is that all the capital is internal. There's no outside investors or anything. It, uh, we trade all sorts of markets, futures and options primarily. Uh, we don't do anything SEC regulated, so no equities or anything like that. Um, the one note I did want to add is everything I'm saying this is just my opinions and my right. thoughts. And I'm talking to the industry as a whole, not speaking for the firm. Yep. Um, just to be clear, because I kind of I kind of go off on a tangent sometimes, and that's <laughs> not the firm. Um, but yeah, so we primarily focus on market making. And my specific job is I focus on market making interest rate derivatives. Okay. So yeah, that's the quick gist. And I um, graduated from Dayton and I've been there ever since. Yeah. Six years. Yeah. So can you, just for, for listeners, you know, can you kind of go over what market making is? I think a lot of people, you know, have probably heard of it before, but they're like, whoa, this is way too complex for me to understand. And I know that you could probably break it down in easy, understandable, digestible format for people. I can try. <laughs> <laughs> so market making sometimes gets a bad rap, but what we do is a little bit different. So basically when someone opens their Schwab account, or opens their Robinhood account or what have you. And you see, you're trying to buy a stock, you'll see the bid and the ask. For something like Apple, the bid and the ask will be really narrow because it's a very liquid security, but for something less liquid, it'll obviously be wider. So as a market maker, what we're doing is we are we are always quoting things. We'll provide a price we'll buy and sell at. And at, when we do that, we're kind of agnostic to which way things go. Um, but the point of a market maker in its simplest form is just to provide liquidity to the market. Right. Um, so if I, so for example, you know, very, very simplistic terms, you know, if I, if me and you were the only people, you know, transacting and I wanted to buy, 
you know, a thousand shares of Apple, for example, you know, you would take the other side of that trade and vice versa. If I wanted to sell a thousand shares of Apple, you would take the opposite side. Correct. And like there's some market makers where they're called a designated market maker, which means they are legally, not necessarily legally, but with the exchange, they're obligated to quote within a certain parameters. Uh, that just depends on the firm or the product. So they're basically mandated to provide some sort of liquidity. And because when you think about it, when you go into your investment account, there's really not that many real people trying to happen to buy and sell at those prices. Mm -hmm. You need the market makers in order to provide that liquidity and make it a more fluent market. But right. the difference with what we, what I'm doing is I'm doing it with options. So it's a little less cut and dry than yeah. with the stock itself. So it's a little bit different, but right. And we'll get in, we'll get into options here, here in a little bit, but, but just to really drive home this, this point for listeners and, you know, me and Matt have talked about this on the podcast before, you know, when you want to, when you want to go buy, you know, Apple or Amazon or really any of the names, the major names in the S and P 500, right. You can buy it and sell it for exactly pretty much the price that you want to, right. Because that bid and ask is, is so narrow. But for example, like smaller cap names, that bid ask is is wider, meaning that you can't necessarily all the time, especially during times of uh, liquidity crunches and market stress, you can't always sell it or buy it for what you want to. Um, and that's, you know, that's uh, that's what, in my opinion, drives up the risk of smaller cap, less liquid names. And again, for listeners, when I talk about liquidity in simple terms, I mean, how quickly can you turn something into cash? How quickly can you turn something into grocery money? I think is a good way to put it for people. At a reasonable price. <laughs> At a reasonable price. <laughs> because you can always like get some cash, you can get cash for it, but you're right. gonna get a good price or not. Yeah, and the, the best example of this for people is, you know, when we were going through uh, COVID in March, just right as the market was bottoming. I don't know if you you saw this at all, AJ, but probably not because you're not on the on the stock side. But you know, one of the names that we were tracking was Sherwin Williams, for example. Oh. So not not a massive company, but not a small company by any means. And there's no, no usually no issues in buying and selling Sherwin Williams for what you want. And, you know, I was watching, you know, my quad system at the time, and I watched Sherwin Williams go from down 20 or 25 percent to flat in the span of about an hour or two. And, you know, that was uh, obviously a time of high market stress, but that is a abnormal, uh, very illiquid environment. When you see a name that's as big as Sherwin Williams go down 2025 and close virtually flat in the span of one or two hours, that's insane. <laughs> and it's not even a high risk secure. It's not like GameStop no, or some shenanigans. No, like it's, that, not a, it's not a meme nuts. stock. It's, it's a legitimate value company, company. Like, right <laughs> that's not something you see every day but but in times of market chaos i say this to people all the time it's everything becomes correlated right that's, yeah everything that's correlations go realize. to one they, they and all that's, do right? and that's a really good example that you brought that up aj because that's exactly what happened this year even with bonds right yeah um it, this was a weird environment because it's like the equity itself is driven by the rates mm -hmm. but yeah it's the same thing where Look at the 60-40 portfolio. It's right. It's not been so pretty. It's gotten absolutely year. crushed. Yeah, it's, it's gotten yeah, crushed. It's not been ideal. So, so, um, so kind of going back to, to your market making and your, you know, your involvement with, with options trading. Again, can you just basically, in, in your words, I know Matt and I have talked about it on the show before, but your words, explain options trading. What is an option? You know, again, something that I think a lot of people have heard of, but they're like, whoa, that's really complex. And I don't even want to dive deep into that. So for, for this is kind of funny, COVID, before COVID, I never really would, I, when I told people what I did, they would look at me like, what? Like, right. but for some reason during COVID and lockdowns and such, options trading got really popular amongst the retail crowd. So it's kind of mm -hmm. cool. Like occasionally someone will know what I do now. I'm like, right. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> it was like, the, it was the hot thing to do, right? Like we were just yeah. talking about you know, uh, the TikTok and social media before we started recording and like everyone was posting how much money that they were making. And, you know, me sitting from like the financial advisor seat, I was like, oh boy, this is really not going to end well at some point. <laughs> yeah. It's when retail comes in, it's not normal. It's not, it's not a good idea. Generally speaking, you're going to see the yeah. outliers, but statistically it's generally not a great idea. Right. But so options are, 
there's a few ways to think of them. First of all, just the standard definition is an option gives you the right to buy or sell something at a given price on or before a specific date, which is the expiration date. If you buy, if you have a call option, it gives you the right to buy it, buy the security. And if you buy a put, it gives you the right to sell it. Um, and if you sell those options, it's the opposite. So if I buy a call option, that means I would want the all else equal, I'd want the security to go up. If I buy a put option, I'd want it to go down. Um, one way to think about options is they're kind of, not exactly, this is a, more of an analogy, they're kind of like an insurance contract where you're paying a state of premium up front as opposed to just buying the underlying as is. So it, it could be used as insurance for a portfolio, like you could buy put options to protect your downside and say the S&P or a given stock, or you can speculate, which isn't as insurance, like to the upside and buy call options. So the reason why I think that's important to, like I like the analogy to insurance is because let's say options are priced based off what expected volatility is. Mm -hmm. So how much do we expect things to move in the future? And if you think about an insurance company, if you try to buy hurricane insurance and you live in Ohio, it's going to be pretty cheap because I don't think <laughs> right. you really have any problems there, right? Yeah. So that would be a low volatility situation. It'd be kind of like, I don't know, Johnson & Johnson. Mm -hmm. But then when there's a lot of, when say when there's market stress or something or higher expected volatility, option prices go up, just like the premium on an insurance policy would go up. Right, so exactly. Get, and, a, and a good analogy now, now, AJ, is is right with Hurricane Ian that ripped through Florida as if insurance wasn't already expenses and expensive enough down there. I can guarantee those pre premiums are going to skyrocket, right? Yeah, I'm sure. It, exactly. And then when it comes to how you think about the pricing, it's you would imagine buying hurricane insurance be a lot cheaper before the hurricane's starting to, you know, gain steam in right. south of Africa. But once that already happens, premiums would go up. So it's just like options, how once there's more expected like turbulence or what have you, or vol implied volatility, prices go up across the board. Right. So I think and that's a can, really important thing to understand. Yeah. And if you're selling options, for example, you know, obviously there's a lot better chance to make more money during periods of high volatility just because mm -hmm. premiums are higher, right? Exactly. And and there's this risk premium between um like on, on options. Options generally are overpriced, historically speaking. But that's also because as a seller, you have unlimited risk, right? If you sell someone an option or sell someone a call option, that stock could go to infinity. I mean, it won't. I don't know what it is. Right. But so you can lose an unlimited amount, but you can only make a certain amount. Yeah. So it's like, it, it, it's, it's tough. So there tends to be that inherent risk premium, just like an insurance company because they're the ones taking on the risk right even though it's they're, it's they're covering your tail risk if right you, if you will and you know the the the, the common theme in, at least in our industry and what we do day to day for clients aj and where we see options come into play is for example you know someone uh works at a, a publicly traded company and a lot of their compensation is by uh, you know restricted stock mm -hmm. units or given stock options that type of thing and you can use uh, options to protect that position, right? So you can either, you know, buy puts or sell calls uh, against the stock that you own just to protect yourself that if the stock goes one way or the other pretty drastically, your net worth isn't, you know, crazily impacted, right? And that could be even more important when there's tax implications, such as mm -hmm. you're waiting for an ISO or something like that to hit the point where you actually get the tax benefits out of it. Right. So say someone wants to sell a stock, because they have a stock option in the secure or what what have you, they can always hedge using options or whatever tools. So there are definitely practical purposes outside of just speculating, uh -huh. which is what you hear about it more often than not. Which is what happened with the retail and, you know, during COVID, right? People were just speculating and buying options, you know, hand over foot because the market was couldn't seem to do any wrong, right? <laughs> Absolutely wild times. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. I'm not that old, but I, in my time, I've never seen anything like that before. Right. Right. So specifically, so how are you using options in, in your day to day with, you know, interest rates and, and what you do? So for my job or just like a, more like the industry as a whole. Um, so what we're doing is we're market making. So if I think an option is worth eight, it doesn't really matter what the unit is. If I think it's worth eight, I might say I'll put a market out there and I'll say I'll pay seven and I'll sell it for nine. 
Mm-hmm. And if someone trades with us, great. If not, oh, well, it's, it's not a big deal either way. So right. we're out there providing liquidity for options, but it's a lot more difficult than just market making an individual stock because you really don't know what these things are worth because there's all these assumptions that have to go into it. So it's a lot harder to find the fair price because it's all theoretical. It's all, you don't really know what it's worth. So for our example, if I can buy an option for seven, I think it's worth eight, there's like a theoretical edge there like because it's I think it's undervalued. Uh-huh. So an example of how like kind of how market making would work is let's say Coke and there's a can of Coke and a can of Pepsi and we think they're both worth a dollar. I, I would quote that and I would say I'll pay 75 cents and I'll sell it at a dollar and 25 cents. If someone sells me a bunch of Pepsi at 75 cents, I can go try to, uh, so I just bought Pepsi for 75 cents. I can go try to sell Coke for a dollar. Uh-huh. And that is like, th- because those things are so correlated, you're kind of like locking in that that spread, if you will. Right. One other way to think about it is, and I hate to say it, I got some experience with this, is uh, with sports books. Yeah. Or like sports betting. Yeah. When you're market making in any capacity, your goal is kind of like the casino where you want even money to be bet on both sides. Because your goal is to try to capture the spread between it. So mm-hmm. if I want to bet on the Patriots and Browns game, and the spread is say three. If fifty percent of people bet on one side, fifty percent bet on the other, I'll just capture that spread. Right. So that's kind of like its essence, what you're trying to do. Right. And exactly. I don't know if that makes sense. If you want to clear that up for yeah, no, it, it does. I think you know a lot of this stuff will will take some time for for people to to wrap their head around. But I mean, for for you for your purposes, you're you know providing liquidity and you know managing risk, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's all risk management and managing the inventory, meaning like the position that you kind of put on over time. Right. And and can you talk about just at a simplistic level what all goes into like an options price? Because I think there's a a misconception out there that you know, just because a stock rises by five or ten dollars, that means someone's option that they bought should rise significantly and be worth more. But a lot of times, obviously, based on volatility and time to expiration, that's simply not the case. And, you know, early in my career, I learned that the hard way (laughs) by doing. Um, But can you kind of just simplistically explain what goes into like the price of an option? Yeah, of course. Uh, so the variables that go into it are obviously what the strike price is, what your where the underlying security is trading, time to expiration, expected volatility, and interest rates. So let's say in your example, let's say you buy a call option on a stock that ex- that expires in a month, and they have an earnings report that comes out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And let's it's let's say the strike price is twenty percent of the money. And then the next day, earnings come out, the stock is up 5%. And you're thinking, great, I might be up money because I bought a call option, which wants the market to go up, right? Mm-hmm. You would think that you, but what happened was now that that event occurred, the earnings report, a ton of the uncertainty just came out of the market. Right. So what happens to premiums? They get crushed. Right. So they come down a lot because that big event that the market was waiting for is gone. Mm-hmm. So even though the stock just went up, there's a good chance you probably are underwater on that trade. Right. So that's what people don't quite get is when you're trading options, you aren't just trading direction. Right. You're also trading all these other variables and that's what makes it so difficult and challenging to price them and market make them and all that. One fun story that kind of is ironic because now I do this for a living is the first option I ever bought okay. was in college. I I had no idea what I was doing. I still don't think I know what I'm doing most of the time, <laughs> uh, to be honest with you. And uh, it was a small company. The ticker, it's so small. No one would know it. But I was trying to buy the $2 strike put option. And just can you go company. over strike strike price again? Yeah, yeah, the strike is the price that you are buying the right to buy or sell at. So if I buy the $10 strike call option in the stock, I have the right to buy that stock at $10. And you would only want to do that if it was trading above $10, Yeah, you'd only want to do it if at expiration or whenever the stock is trading above. Otherwise, it just expires worthless. Right. Because you wouldn't want to use your option if you could buy it at a lower price. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So when, when you buy a put option, you have the right to sell. So I was trying to bet against this company. So what I did is I was like, okay, yeah, I'm, I, I, this all makes sense, I thought. <laughs> and then, so I put in an order to buy a one lot of this option. So it's like single contract, which represents a hundred shares. Mm-hmm. The most that option could ever be worth would be two, mm-hmm. right? Because if the stock, the stock can't trade below zero, so even if it went to zero, the most that object could be worth is two. I put in a market order, meaning e. just, just I want to fill get it at this. any price. Just yeah. fill it any price doesn't matter. I paid two dollars and a penny, <laughs> and the stock was trading like five. Right. <laughs> so I basically, even if the stock went to zero, which is my bet, I still would have lost money. Right. Which and is that's ironic because some yeah. market maker traded with me, and I'm like, oh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Was, and this, the, the, the person that was on the other side was like, oh boy, this isn't, this is easy. Like, oh, look easy at this. Reach, reach yeah. This is free as it gets. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Um, yeah. I just thought of that and I was like, okay, this is yeah, kind that's of ironic a ironic situation that happened. So, so again, kind of going back to options, another thing that I thought about AJ is, you know, there's, there's a couple different ways that you know, once the option expires, people have the option of doing with it. They can let it expire, you know, worthless, or they could let it expire or just sell it right before it expires and and take the the difference that they paid in it, or they can exercise an option. So can you just go through those different scenarios with the different options that, no pun intended, that people have when trading options? Yeah. So if I am long, long means I bought it. Um, Mm -hmm. If I'm long the $10 strike call, in the stock and it expires today and this stock closes today at 15. What I would, or say it hasn't expired yet. Say it's going to expire at the end of today. I, I could either, my options would be, I can either sell that option that I'm long and just take the difference, which I'm probably up money at that point. I mean, it depends mm-hmm. when I bought it or whatever. Just lock um, in your profit. Yeah. I can just lock it in like that, or I can wait till the end of the day and I'll automatic generally automatically get exercise the option Mm -hmm. so i would buy 100 shares at 10 right um the other thing you can do which is a little more complicated is instead of just taking off like just selling the option that you were that you bought you could short 100 shares of the stock before the close and then once your um position gets exercised your position's flat right so if I short the stock and then I my option comes in that night, my position will show zero. Right. So like that's more of something someone more institutional would tend to do. Is yeah. They, they would generally not ever sell out the option. But retail doesn't like uh, exercising. So right. they tend to just take it off. And I yeah. actually totally get that. It's yeah. Kind of so what, so let's dig into that a little bit. So, you know, when you're, you know, going back to your example, you know, you're long, you know, one call option of XYZ stock strike price is 10. It's trading at 15. You're getting close to the end of the day. You see how much you're up in terms of percentage on your option. Is that typically the same percentage or somewhere similar if you were to exercise the option and actually take delivery of those shares and then turn around the next day and sell it at the market? I mean, it would just depend. Yeah, yeah, it would be, but it would just depend on if it moved after hours, like into the next trading day. Right. But yeah, I mean, theoretically, it should be basically the same. Right. It would just be a matter of if we move. So that's why generally an institutional investor, they wouldn't want to wait for that next trading day. So what they'll do is they will short the stock prior to the close, because by doing that, they're locking in their trade right then. Right. Because otherwise who knows something could happen and it's down 30 percent monday morning right and at that point it's like oh that was a bummer <laughs> right exactly so it was five dollars in the money and now it's not <laughs> right 50 cents so that's generally how an institution or hedge fund or what have you would manage get a little bit more complex with it yeah it, it's not it seems hard or more difficult but once you get it it's kind of all makes sense right it seems right. like a different language when you first get into it like uh I have friends of mine that trade in the trading pit in Chicago still, like, which mm-hmm. is actually a thing. It's open outcry. They're all yelling Physical. at each other. Yeah. yeah it, it's a really cool thing to see. And if anyone's ever in Chicago, gets a chance to go down there. It's actually pretty active and 
people are all down there they're really nice and it's it's a cool thing because i don't who knows how long it'll still be there right exactly so exactly it's, that. I would venture to guess not very long, just with the way things are, this digital transformation in our economy, right? I would have thought that. I did think that. But if COVID did not close um, some of these pits, I don't know what will. Right. Um, only because the, the institutions that are trading it want more liquidity. And in the pit setting, what happens is all the market makers are together. So by getting them all together in one spot, you can get a lot more group think and they can mm-hmm. get a lot more size done at one price. Right. And so for some of these big institutional products, the bank, they really like it, which is that's interesting. intuitive. But if COVID didn't kill it, I don't know what it will. Right. Yeah, that's a good That would have been the take. time. Right. Right. So we'll, we'll see. I'm probably wrong, <laughs> but who knows? So, so do you have uh, just piggybacking on on the story you just told? Any more stories that you think would be uh, interesting for for people to hear? I think that's you know part of the podcast is you know storytelling, right? And I think a lot of people can relate to some of these things. So, any other interesting ones that you wanted to share? Yeah, the, it's uh again, I've only been in the industry for like six years, but I've been super intrigued by everything for a long time but in this last six seven years there's been a lot that's happened honestly we've seen a lot of different environments uh the first thing that i would say was super crazy was when oil traded negative yeah. i don't know if you guys talked about that at all on the podcast we did yeah it was crazy it, especially because where we are now it's just <laughs> right. you know, like oh it went from we have way too much of this what do we do with it to now we don't have enough well, you now we don't have enough <laughs> But I had a, a friend of mine who was telling me, hey, I think oil could trade negative. And I looked you at him. You probably like, like, yeah, right. I, I laughed out loud. I was like, no, you're insane. Like, who, that would just never happen. And he was right. Um, and he did really well on that trade. I was like, I never would have saw that coming. But that was, I got a phone call. And because I was doing something else and they were like, hey, check an oil. And I, I remember looking and it was negative $38. Oh my gosh. And that's something I never thought I would see in my career. I don't think anyone saw that, thought that would happen. Right. Uh, it, it frankly broke a lot of things in the system. Yeah, like it did. Way- because, you know, with, and, and, and I'll ask you about kind of futures trading here in a second. But, you know, what essentially happened was that, you know, people, who had oil that were trying to get rid of it were paying other people to take delivery of this stuff. And that mm-hmm. is like, you, you like never see that. Right. I was paying you to take it from me. Right. I was <laughs> Just paying to you get to it off of your hands because a lot of these times, again, it's speculators, it's hedgers and people don't want to take delivery of it. They're just trading it for, for risk management or a mm-hmm. number of different options. But you have to think when these futures contract expire, that oil has got to get delivered somewhere, right? Yep. So can you talk and, about, you know, futures and how that, you know, might different f- differ from options? Yeah. So futures, that is a straight up obligation on both sides of like both sides of the trade. The option gives people optionality. So if I buy a futures right. contract, say I buy a gold futures contract for $1,800. What that means and say it expires in December of this year. It, in December of this year, if I just held that thing the entire time and didn't take it off, I would be obligated to pay $1,800 an ounce for 100 ounces of gold. Regardless so of where gold's trading. Regardless of where gold's trading. So it actually has a practical purpose for farmers and all that sort of, like people in uh, industries that require commodities or anything mm-hmm. like that. So if you're a farmer and you have a massive wheat field, your underlying business is subject to a lot of risk. You have no idea. You, I mean, you can estimate, but you don't know how much you're going to be able to make when you harvest all this wheat. Right. So what they could do is they could sell futures contracts at whenever their harvest would be or whenever. And what they could do is lock in that price now to right. take out that risk. And on the other end of the spectrum, McDonald's or someone can be on the other side of the trade. They can lock in the price they're buying it at. Mm -hmm. So that's why futures were originated. It's become, I mean, it's a lot of speculating now too. It always has to mitigate volatility and business risk for, for farmers really is. It makes total sense. Yeah. They do it with interest rates. They do it with everything. And Mm -hmm. that was the fundamental purpose is so you can hedge, you can protect yourself. 
Um, but the difference between a future and option is the futures. It's They're actually obligated. Yeah, like you're locking in that price. In at at this point in time, you can trade out of it. Mm-hmm. But you're doing with an option, you're paying premium to have the opportunity to do something. Right. So you just for That's with an option, you have the right to buy or sell that security. Mm-hmm. You're not obligated to do so. Yeah, you don't have to. Right. Um, so that's that's the big difference between the two. Interesting. Very interesting. But well, how about, I mean, fun. yeah, fun. I'm sure. I'm sure. I guess the last question from, you know, a situation that you went through was, you know, the, the interest rate environment when we went through COVID and how rates were so low and they came, you know, obviously roaring back uh, mm-hmm. where we sit today. What was that environment like for you? It was actually more mellow than you would think. I, I would actually, or I would argue that the rise in rates has been more interesting than that fall because what happened is rates fell so quickly. It, it was it was like a, and the Fed just cuts to zero basically. Mm-hmm. And so once that happened, after it kind of shook out for a couple of weeks, trading was actually pretty slow, just because who's trying to trade options when rates are already at zero. Mm-hmm. Right. There isn't as much risk or there's not as much to hedge. There's not as much uncertainty at that point. It's like, oh, it's we've seen this rodeo before. Right. Like everyone's thinking, oh, the Fed's never raising rates again, you know. But now in this environment, it's been a lot more interesting. Granted, it hasn't been as sharp of like a move as we had during COVID, but it's been weird. It's yeah. I think it all makes sense. Like I never think the market's wrong. No, uh, but sometimes it does seem to get ahead of itself at times. Uh, but that's just human emotions, right? right. And, and robots, I guess. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. So I guess we're where do you think rates are, are headed now and, and into next year? You know, we're at the end of the year and I think the market's pricing in after CPI, I think it's pricing in a 50 bit rate hike before the end of the year and then mm-hmm. the Fed's starting to slow. So where do you guys see rates going? I this is just me personally. Uh I think it's tough. I I find bonds personally att- very attractive at this level from an investing yeah. standpoint because you can lock in a real yield, especially if you hedged the inflation risk, which I'm not suggesting anyone do. Right. But you can lock in a real yield, which I can't remember last time we were able to do that. I mean, yeah. Actually, not that long ago. But it, it's just kind of a refreshing thing to have these new investment options as opposed to just Oh, I, I'm stuck. You got to buy equities. Right. Oh, yeah. I can get treasury for four and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Or a one, like a 12 month, we're seeing yields that are like four, four and a half on, on treasuries. And that was, you know, if you came to me three years ago and said, hey, in 2022, you're going to be able to get four and a half percent, which three years ago, that's what you were getting for like some high yield debt, right? It was like four and a half, five to seven percent. And now it's I like, said oh my you were gosh. Nuts. Yeah. Yeah, no one would ever thought I that. I would have thought no way that can't in, unless something really bad happened. Yeah. Or, so, or it would have had to be something like what happened with all the inflation or like that that's the only thing that I could have probably thought would have made it possible. Right. But it, so with rates it's hard to say in and, and I don't like really trying to predict the Fed. I, I have no idea. Right. If I had to if I had to bet they're probably going to reverse revert course at some point. But but I really don't think rates are going to go back down to zero again. Uh, And that's what I that's what I've been saying. Which I think is good. I think it's unhealthy. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is too. And I I think a lot of people when they talk about a Fed quote unquote pivot, they think Mm -hmm. okay they raise and then they're going to lower back to where we were a couple of years ago. And my argument is, and again, my my opinion doesn't matter. The market doesn't doesn't care what I think. But my opinion is that they're just going to slow and then they're going to hold rates at, you know, higher than they have been over the past couple of years. And that's what their pivot is going to be. I don't think necessarily they're going back to one. <laughs> and I, I just look, I mean, that's exactly how it's priced. Right. Like the market's basically saying longer term, if Fed funds will be around two and a half, three and a quarter percent. And that's kind of what we're going to be. Who knows? Um, I I, th- I kind of hope that's the case from a fundamental perspective, because I think yeah. it's a healthy rate. Um, and I think it does the job, but it's, it's going to be interesting. I, I've never seen anything like this before. I feel like every year there's something that makes the year like, Oh, never seen that before. And yeah. the longer I've been in this industry, the more I realize I know nothing. Yeah. Um, 
because there's just so many things to know so many I even after 50 years I would I just go down new rabbit holes I'm like oh I didn't know that's how that worked Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a continue you have to always be trying to improve and I'm sure you feel the same way it's like with how you do research yeah you just so it's a lot of work yeah. yeah, it is. And it take it takes time. It's just like lifelong learning, right? You know, you could spend a yeah. hundred years in, in really any given industry and learn something new every single day. So with that, you know, with that being said, you know, to wrap up this conversation, any any other lessons that you've learned over, you know, your your short career so far that are things that you would have done differently back in the day? Um, the one thing, so I do some consulting on the side, just like on my own for some financial stuff. I and you see it in trading all the time. There's so many behavioral biases we all have. And the one thing I think is wildly important is for people to try to realize what those are. Uh-huh. And whether it's from an investing standpoint of, do you like follow the herd, you know, or do you, right. it just, you just see them all the time. And that's why it's so good to have a financial advisor or people like you kind of helps people keep their head, heads on during right. periods, tumultuous periods, kind of like we're going through now. And, and I think that there's to not to cut you off, AJ, but just yeah, so I cool. don't forget this point. I think now, now more than ever, there's so much outside noise that makes people question their investment philosophy or their investment decisions or how their portfolio is allocated. Because you can hop on Twitter and say, and you know, see, for example, Stanley Drunkenmiller is recommending buying XYZ company. And people will be like, oh, if Stan's buying it, then I should be buying it. And what people don't understand is that you know, Stan's risk is def- definitely a lot different from a retail trader's risk. And they're their situations are completely different and you're not actually seeing into his book if he's actually doing what he's saying i'm not saying he's a liar but such an important thing right there but people people what people do and what they say are two different things a lot of the times 100 percent. and you also don't know what people are trading something against Mm -hmm. for example if you see there's a there's massive short interest in a stock that doesn't necessarily mean a lot of people are shorting it because they're betting it's going to go down. Mm-hmm. They could be hedges against all sorts of options and derivatives plays. So it's not necessarily people betting against the stock. I mean, it is technically because they're shorting something, right. but it could be against right. something else. So when you see so-and-so bought XYZ, especially a hedge, you don't know why or what are they doing that against? Is it a hedge? Is it Right. And it could be, anything? you know, it could be. And especially on Twitter, you can see, you know, XYZ hedge fund or investor bought, you know, however many shares. It could be to close a position, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. and, I've, and you probably agree with this. When it comes to insider buys and sells, yeah. from just more of an investing standpoint, I do not think the sells are very important. Mm-mm. Because you can sell for, and we talk about this a lot, AJ, is, you know, you can sell for a, a million different reasons, but people only buy for one reason, right? Yeah, it's because you think it's going up. And frankly, (laughs) that's one of the biggest issues I've seen with people from an investing standpoint is that they have way too much money in their own company, in Mm -hmm. the company that they work for. Right. So when you see one of these executives basically doubling down on not just their human capital, but buying more on top of all their golden handcuffs and all the other deals, that's normally a pretty bullish sign, just kind of. I've never cashed that, so I don't know, but. Yeah, and I actually, guess. have you have you heard a sentiment trader? I've heard it, of it. Yeah, I think his name, one of the guys' names that runs it's Jay Kappel, I think, and and you know he has a chart that is back tested, you know, insider uh, corporate buying and selling, and it's interesting to see, you know, how accurate these insiders are at, at, at timing, you know, especially the buys. Okay. Yeah, and it's t- t- typically yeah. during, you know, when everyone mm-hmm. thinks the world's going to end, everything's going to hell in a handbasket you know, markets falling and these guys are the ones that are stepping in and buying, you know, that's a, that's a pretty bullish thing. And we've seen that insider buying start to pick up over the past couple of months, which I think is, is interesting, you know, looking forward. What's your equity out market outlook? So, in- yeah, I, I, it's a great question. And I'm, I'm pretty bullish at least for the next six to 10 months. So if you look at, you know, uh, market performance after a midterm election, especially from a seasonality standpoint, it tends to be really strong. Um, and in addition to that, Q4 just tends to be the strongest average for stocks in any given quarter out of any given year. 
Um, but it's interesting because I was reading research and I put this out to our clients uh, several times before this year is that every year since 1950, the market has never been negative one year out after the midterm elections, which is really interesting to me. Um, and again, I always, I'm always the person that's saying, hey, your worst drawdowns ahead of you, you know, this could always revert. It doesn't always have to play out like it has in the past. But just looking at history and how much damage has already been done to the market, I think, and how low expectations and sentiment is, I mm-hmm. think the next six to 10 months could actually be pretty good in terms of stock market returns. I, I thought the returns since the CPI number were pretty aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Uh, I, but again, we, we, they sold, we sold off aggressively as well. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, the one thing I will counter uh, at mm-hmm. is when it comes to seasonality, I'm, that's not, I guess I'm on the opposite end of that, mm-hmm. just where I, I just feel like there's so much data out there that you, you can make any data look good in any mm-hmm. situation or, or whatever. It, especially with the election seasonality it's with right. the presidential election specifically we do not i feel like we don't have enough data it's statistically significant uh-huh. but i just don't know i don't know I, I still haven't come to a conclusion on how much yeah well it's, it's interesting and i would encourage you to check out you know um you know market performance especially for a first term president in the midterm that year to be pretty good that time, I mean, it tracked that's, like perfectly this year. And yeah, again, it's been, not always going to do that. But it, I was mm-hmm. like, oh, this has played out to, to be pretty interesting. But I just think, I, you know, again, we don't just use seasonality. We use a combination of, oh, of, of different factors. And I think, you know, while I think that there's going to continue to be a rotation between growth and value and international and domestic, small versus large, I think that there's enough room for rotation to continue to happen that things aren't as bad as the media makes it out to be right now. Um, and that just people are so pessimistic that it could set up for potential future strong returns. Oh, for sure. And like, and I've heard you reference this before, like if that people have been waiting for an opportunity right? and it's only, I think it's fat pitch is that. Yeah. Fat pitch. Okay, yeah. yeah. Like if, and if at least dip your toes in the water, right. Um, because the, the best opportunities are never going to feel good. No, it's like, never going to feel comfortable to buy. <laughs> like during COVID, would you have felt comfortable buying March 26th no. or whenever that was? No. Absolutely not. But sometimes you have to take a leap of faith and mm-hmm. just kind of say, you know what? I am bullish on America or whatever country or economy yep. and human progress and whatever, and just kind of go for it because otherwise you're going to be losing X amount a year in cash. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And that's what, you know, we've talked about that before and, you know, there's been several research papers out there and at least I've come to the conclusion that if you're long-term and meaning, you know, five to 10 years out, it's better to, to put it all in all at once, but just from a psychological standpoint, that doesn't sit well with a lot of people. And I understand why, and, you know, dollar cost averaging will work to help some of that emotional bit side of things help out. And we've always said this before, you know, we'll always give clients or, or people on the podcast the optimal uh, way to do something. But in, in financial planning, that's not necessarily um, always the right move because we're all human. Uh, we're very emotional when it comes to our own money. And if it helps you better to sleep at night when your head hits the pillow and you want a dollar cat cost average over the next 6, 12, 12, 18 months, then let's go ahead and do that. As long as we're doing something and we're not just le- letting money erode away in cash, especially with inflation right now, let's just get it going. There's there's massive value to that. Like, is mm-hmm. the mental aspect, you don't want to do things that make you wildly uncomfortable. Like right. I, I can see the best trade in the world, but I'm not going to do so much of it that I can't sleep. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it could be awesome, but like everyone has their risk tolerance, what they can handle and all that. And you got to take it into consideration. Right. And, it, exa- and, it, and a, I was going to okay. say just a perfect example, just of what happened last week with, you know, FTX filing for, for bankruptcy, you know, AJ, I, I can't tell you the number of people that I've talked to that just went all in on, on crypto and that are going to get burned by this. And it's, I mean, it sounds like from prelim, preliminary estimates, it's going to be like 10 to 20 cents on the dollar that people are going to get paid out from this stuff. 
I wouldn't be surprised if it's less than that. Just if yeah. I just I have no reason to say that. I just right. It's yeah, gonna be. I, it I it, and I I feel really bad for people that were in that mm-hmm. situation. Um, but the good thing is, in a lot of cases, at least they're younger and they can recover for it right. from it because it's more of a right. technological thing. It's it, it it it's really sad for that the industry and all that that this happened. Um, unfortunately, it's part of that game for now i was shocked that, that happened so quickly and yeah, then all the news too. that's come out it's wasn't great uh no, there was it's... one other thing i did want to touch on before yeah please I, I, before i let you go off and do your work yeah here, and that is yeah. Uh, payment for order flow yeah that's been a big um, topic especially a... in in the retail industry with you know mm-hmm. trades trading going to zero and I, I don't think a lot of people know why that happened but if you want to touch on that it'd be great yeah, so payment for order flow has been in the news because of the Robinhood debacle, uh, really with GameStop and all this stuff. Um, again, my firm does not do any of this. We are not even, we don't even trade equities. This is just something I'm trying to explain because I see all this misleading information on the internet. Um, so basically, when you pull up your Schwab account and you see the bid ask spread, if you just press market order, what will happen is if you want to sell something, you're going to sell the bid price. And if you want to buy it, you're going to buy the ask price. What payment for order flow does is it sends that order to a fund like Citadel or what have you, and they will improve that price. So they're paying to have that order flow because they see like statistical advantage to it. Mm -hmm. But because it's getting routed to them, it's actually saving you money because they have to improve the price or give you the same price that the market is offering right now. Right. So that it actually saves retail money. But the problem is it's a massive conflict of interest. Yeah. That's the issue is with the Robin Hood debacle, it was they sold a lot of their orders to Citadel. Mm-hmm. And then Citadel apparently, allegedly, you heard rumors they had a short position. You know, it's so like that's where it gets really weird and wildly it can be immoral, to say the least. Right. But I, I just wanted to say like the payment for order flow concept, retail's not it's actually beneficial to them in terms of their execution, price execution, even though it is a little suspect on what's going on behind the curtain. Right. And when you're talking about order flow, you're meaning, you know, when, when Robin hood sells that, to, you know, Citadel, for example, Citadel can see exactly how these Robin hood traders are, are placing their bets and they have a statistical advantage to see, Hey, if, you know, you know, 70% of the trades are on one side of it. It's like, oh, maybe we'll we'll take a short position there and see what happens. Because typically, not typically, but a lot of times in our industry, when everyone piles into to the same trade, like you were talking about with like sports betting, sometimes it goes the other way and pretty violently. Yeah, no, for sure. And I just want to touch on that because it's it, it has a bad rap, which it should. I just don't think it's as terrible as the people make it sound people think yeah Yeah. and it's under you know that's you know those companies uh you know that route order order flow are are under uh, a microscope right now i think too so maybe it it won't be as bad as it was initially when it started but um, yeah we'll see we'll see for sure but did you have any clients that were super into the um, gamestop stuff no, we got asked about it. I think the, the biggest question was because a lot of our clients, they're like, hey, you guys have discretion. You know, you guys are the professionals. You guys do what you think is in our best interest. So a lot of the a lot of the clients um, that are kind of hands off were like just called and were like, hey, just curious. Are we, you know, are we involved in any of these stocks that are just going absolutely nuts right now? And, and obviously the answer was no. Um, but yeah, people just asked about it and we had a couple that were like, Hey, should, you know, should we get involved in this? And I was like, well, what's your appetite for risk? And, you know, we go through the risk conversation and it ends up being, yeah, you're right. We we probably shouldn't do this. Being in Amsterdam last week, if, um, with like Bitcoin, all the stuff, it all kind of felt like a, the tulip mania situation. I don't know if people talk about that with your clients. (laughs) Yeah, we have, (laughs) which is, which is not so history repeats itself. Yeah. It does. We don't tend to learn very well. No, we don't. <laughs> As we humans, just, you know, we, is, we repeat. Yeah. What's cycles. what's the same? What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That's what they say. Yeah. And, it's, <laughs> and, and, if, and if that is, I've never looked it up. But then if it is the definition, it's perfect for yeah. market psychology and just 
how every part of life right seriously (laughs) seriously so but aj listen it was great having you on thanks for spending some time with us today really appreciate it um maybe again in in a year or two we'll have you back on and see what's changed in in your world and see what else we have to talk about but i think this will be really insightful for a lot of our listeners thanks for having me on i really appreciate it all right everybody thanks for tuning in to episode number 176 of the independent advisors podcast Hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week and weekend, and we'll be back with you next week. Thank you for listening to the Independent Advisors Podcast. If you're interested in hearing more, hit the subscribe button so you can be notified every time a new episode gets released. Feel free to share with friends, family, and follow us on Twitter at Jessup Wealth, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Mark and Matt will continue to share beneficial information on these social media sites. Also, check out the podcast tab on their website. That's www.jessupwealthmanagement.com. There you'll find links to every episode of the Independent Advisors. Have questions or topics you want to discuss on the show? Message us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or send an email with the words questions and topics in the subject line to inquiries at jessupwealthmanagement.com. We'll talk about it right here on the podcast. Certain sections of this commentary may contain forward-looking statements based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. All indices are unmanaged and are not available for direct investment by the public. Past performance is not indicative of future results. This podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and does not constitute either tax, legal, or financial advice. Although we do go to great lengths to make sure our information is accurate and useful, we recommend you consult a tax preparer, professional tax advisor, financial advisor, or lawyer regarding your specific circumstances. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. No strategy can guarantee any objective or goal will be achieved. Advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network, a registered investment advisor.